This week, Patina Gappa, author of Out of Darkness, Shining Light, a novel about Dr. Livingston set after his death, talks about how she drew inspiration from Shakespeare. It's that idea of the absent protagonist who drives the plot that, that really is, is what makes uh, Julius Caesar the great play that it is. So I wanted Livingston to have a similar sort of effect uh, that even in his death, he still has this incredible pull. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and with me is my co-host and mother, Caroline Kilborn. Hello, Thank you everyone. very much, Monica. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. I'm, I'm delighted to be invited on the show. <laughs> so our guest today is Patina <clears throat> Gappa. She is a lawyer specializing in international trade and investment as well as a writer, and she's the author of An Elegy for Easterly, The Book of Memory, and Rotten Row. Her work has been shortlisted for, among others, the Orwell Prize, the Los Angeles Times Book Award, and the Pen America Open Book Award. She is currently living in, um, Har- I'm not sure how to pronounce that, Zimbabwe, but I'm not sure that's the first, the first part. <laughs> Harare. <laughs> Out of Darkness, Shining Light. And it's a novel, and it's a very interesting, very interesting book. Yeah, welcome to Writer's Voices, Patina. Thank you very much to both, to both <laughs> you and Caroline. Thank you, Monica. So... I understand that this is the book you've been wanting to write for 20 years. Do you want to tell us why that is? Yes, it was actually meant to be my first novel. It was the, f- the, the book that I was going to use to introduce my voice to the world. Um, I first had the idea for it in 1998, and I actually wrote the first draft on a floppy disk, which I still have. <laughs> I consider it my, <laughs> my lucky charm. Ah! And <laughs> but the question is, do you have a computer that can, can read the disc? No, I bought one of those little gizmos that ah. has a USB at the end of it that you can. Yes, so I can, I can still read I can still read it. It's funny, I actually asked a, a bunch of kids that I talked to in Berlin last week if they knew what a floppy disc was. And somebody said, yeah, I think it's something that you play games on. <laughs> Which made me realize just how very old I am. But yes, uh, it was meant to be my first book, and um, I've had the idea for it back then. But I just have uh, a serious case of imposter syndrome. I just didn't really trust myself to to tell this story, let alone any story. And I also didn't feel I knew enough about the world of the characters to actually make a success of it. And what convinced you that you did? Well, I spent many, many years researching it and thinking about it and just playing with different versions of it. And I also wrote three other books which made me realize that, you know, I might actually be just a little bit good at this writing thing. So I, I, eventually, got the, I eventually got the confidence to, to write this. And I always say to people, and I think they got really irritated by this, that the first three books I felt were sort of my apprenticeship and this is the book that is going to start to get me close to mastery, I think. Uh, I've got ten more books, or rather I've got ten books that I want to write, so I've got five more books before I can consider myself a master. But I sort of feel that my, my first three books were kind of a rehearsal for this one. Wow. And what, what are your earlier books about? Well, the first book isn't actually a book, really. It's a, it's short stories that I wrote for t- over 22 months. And then when my uh, agent sent out my novel, which became my second book, it came, it went out in uh, you know a few chapters with a synopsis, and everybody got excited about the novel. And then my agent said, well, how about if we send out these stories as sort of a placeholder while they're waiting for the novel? And it's just as well, because they waited for six years. <laughs> it took me a long time. It took me a long time to, to finish the novel. Again, that imposter syndrome struck me very badly. And I, the, the book, the first book, An Energy for Italy, which is a collection of short stories, had been reasonably successful. And that success actually freaked me out so much that I became terrified about writing the second book. Um, so then I ended up writing, in those six years that I was dithering and, you know, hesitating over my second book, I wrote 
other things, you know, including the, the third book, which was also a, sh- a story collection, but I wrote it for myself. You know, no one knew I was writing it. I just presented it to my agent once it was done. And that's pretty much how I wrote this novel as well. I have actually realized that I'm not the kind of writer who sells things before they are finished. So I just want to finish things and then tell people about them. Because otherwise it's too much pressure? It's too much pressure. And also, I changed my mind a lot about that book, the Book of Memory, in those six years. The first uh, chapters that went out were very different to what I actually produced in the end. I mean, I, I want to believe they were as good, but... I want to actually be confident that what I've written is the thing that I really want the world to see before I share it with anyone else. And that was a big lesson, really, that I learned. Uh, And I'm very glad I learned it fairly early on in my career. So tell us what Out of Darkness, Shining Light is about. It's the story of the last journey of the Scottish explorer David Livingston. And... It's not just the last journey, it's also the final journey, because it's the journey that he makes as a corpse, as a dead body, from what is now northern Zambia to the eastern coast of Africa. And on that journey, he is carried by his African companions, the porters who carried his his boxes as they traveled. And it is a journey that is narrated by two characters. One is called Halima, uh, a woman, who was Livingstone's cook, and the other is Jacob Wainwright, a freed slave who was the scribe of the party. And what drew you to this story? I learned about David Livingston as a young child. I first read uh, about his life in a Ladybird book. Um, I don't know if you know these Ladybird books. They were very popular across the Commonwealth, and they were kind of like early introductions to to, you know, the heroes of uh, the British Empire. So there would be a Lady Bird book on David Livingston. There was one on um, Sir Walter Raleigh, I remember. Another on uh, Francis Drake. There was one on Queen Elizabeth. One on Florence Nightingale. There were very few uh, women heroes, right? So I remember reading um, the David Livingston one when I was, I was about 10 or 11. And I remember being struck by the last page which showed David Livingstone's body being carried by his companions. And I remember that line, his faithful companions, Chuma and Susie, carried his body for nine months from the interior to the coast of Africa. And I remember thinking, wow, that's really extraordinary. I wonder why they did it. And then I sort of forgot it. And then when, when we did history, when I was 16, because to understand the history of Southern Africa, you need to understand the journeys of Livingston. So when we did history and I traced out the journeys of Livingston in my history book, which, by the way, I still have, um, I again wrote that line at the end of uh, his li- you know, at the end of his life, he was very ill. He died in Chitambo, northern Zambia, and his faithful companions, Chuma and Susie, carried his body for nine months. And that's when it struck me what an incredibly strange thing for them to have done. And I thought, ah, oh, this might make a very good film one day. Then I forgot about it. And then later on, as I was thinking about writing, I thought, wow, that story about David Livingstone's companions might actually be a very good novel. So it was. Is, yeah, it was. So is the story of Dr. Livingston well known by school children in Af- throughout Africa or just in southern Africa or not at all? Oh, yes. I mean, you, you cannot understand the history of modern Africa without understanding the, the travels of Livingston, especially if you're from southern Africa. The capital of Malawi is a city called Blantyre, and Blantyre is a village near Glasgow in Scotland where David Livingston was born. One of the most famous schools in, in Malawi is called the Livingstonia Mission. And um, in, in Zimbabwe, we have the Victoria Falls which was a waterfall that he, quote-unquote, discovered and named after Queen Victoria. Across, you know, from Victoria Falls is, is the town of Livingston in Zambia. We have uh, David Livingston schools all over um, southern Africa. So it's really difficult to understand the history of our countries without understanding the role that Livingston played in shaping that history. Well, it's interesting to me that there's, that he's still... His name is still used in so many ways in Africa. That's very interesting, I think. It, it is very interesting. It is very interesting, Caroline, because I think it says something about uh, 
how Livingston is perceived, even in in modern independent African nations. Uh, we treat Livingston very differently from Stanley, you know, Henry Morton Stanley, with whom he's also associated. I don't know how many Americans will remember the the quotation, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but what happened is that, yeah, what happened is that when Livingston was lost in uh, in deepest Africa, as they called it, he, he was uh, eventually found by Stanley, this journalist, who was sent by the New York Herald to look for him, and they found him in, in Ujiji, which is a place... Uh, uh, in, in what is now modern Tanzania, and when he saw Livingston, he apparently told everyone, he said, Dr. Livingston, I presume, but I actually looked at the journal in which he wrote that, but th- that line doesn't appear. It appears much, much later. But um, Stanley is not as well-loved a character in African history as Livingston because Stanley was one of the men who helped the king of Belgium to colonize what is uh, what was then called the Belgian Congo, which is now uh, the country of uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the former Zaire. And it was a very brutal process of colonization. You know, they had these rubber plantations, and they would chop off people's arms and legs if they were suspected of theft and all that kind of thing. Whereas Livingston has had a more successful transition uh, to modern Africa because he's, of course, associated with the ending of the slave trade. It's something that he, he, he felt very strongly about, even though he himself was actually quite conflicted on the slave trade because he also relied on some slave traders to help him find his way. Right. But the, but the, uh, after, he was, after his death, then that's when the colonization really be, began in force. Uh, exactly, and... yeah. So he died in 1873, and then just soon after that, then the scramble for Africa really began in earnest, uh, and it eventually ended in a conference in Berlin uh, 11 years later in 1884, where they really carved out carved out the continent. So he himself, uh, Livingston, wasn't a colonialist in the sense that he wanted Africa colonized. He wanted what he called the three C's for Africa. He wanted Christianity. He wanted commerce. And he wanted what he called civilization. And, of course, the Christianity and civilization were linked together. And the commerce, he thought, um, if Africans, you know, had other opportunities to trade, they would stop trading in slaves. So those were the three C's that he, that he wanted for Africa. And then, of course, came a fourth C, which was colonization. So is he considered a force for good or bad by most Africans? Or I don't know that you can speak for most Africans, but in your opinion... Well, I try very hard not to speak for most Africans. <laughs> I can barely manage to speak for myself most days. <laughs> no, but that's a really good question, actually, because I, I realized as I was traveling, especially in East Africa, I spent a lot of time in, on, the, on the island of Zanzibar, where I wrote much of uh, the Jacob Wainwright narration, and I also, you know, spent a lot of time in on the mainland of Tanzania in Bagamoyo, uh, where he spent his last night uh, on African soil. And it's it's really interesting what's happened to Livingston in his death because he's become the saint because um, the Victorians did a very good job of sanctifying him. And I was very fascinated to see that certainly in East Africa, the sainthood of Livingston, that, that myth of, you know, Livingston, the great liberator, is still very much continuing. But I suspect that's because it, it helps with tourism. You know, I think there's a tourism element to to the Livingston myth. So, for instance, um, if you go to Bagamoyo and you go to the church in which his companions laid him uh, when they arrived in Bagamoyo, part of part of the part of the, the the cross of the church is actually taken from some of the wood that was used to transport him, and they took with great affection of Livingston as the man who ended the slave trade and so on. So, I think that there's a there's still very much uh, sort of a reference for Livingston that's linked to, to the way he ended the slave trade. But I think he, he also benefits by, you know, he also benefits these countries by bringing tax dollars to East Africa. Uh-huh. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. And our guest today is Bettina Gapa, author of Out of Darkness, Shining Light. So, Patina, you this book is written, as you say, from the point of view of two characters, um, Livingston's cook and then Jacob Wainwright. 
these are real historical characters. They did really exist. Why did you choose these two to tell the story? Yeah, um, yes, they, they are indeed uh, real historical characters. And I first came across them in David Livingstone's journals himself, um, especially the character of Halima. She's mentioned quite a few times by Livingstone, and he speaks of her with great affection and some irritation as well because he says of her, she's a good soul, but she has an outrageous tongue. And and Stanley himself, when he... Um, when he, when he talks of uh, um, you know his his eight months with David Livingston, he also mentions um, uh, Halima, and he says of her, we could hear the sound of a furious gossip from where we sat, right? Um, so I, I I was very struck by the presence of women on the expeditions because that was one of the big surprises from my research, and then the other character is a man, Jacob Wainwright, who who is a rescued slave. Um, he's a rescued slave, and he has been taken to India to be educated and Christianized and Europeanized, and he's really drunk, you know, what I would call the Kool-Aid of Christianity. He's become this really extreme caricature of uh, of a civilized African. So I thought the two voices would be a very interesting contrast. But actually, Monica and Caroline, they were not the first voices. I mean, they were not the first, uh, the only voices that I that I eventually um, that, that I started writing this book in. Oh, what were the, what were others, and what happened to them? Well, I was initially inspired by William Faulkner, right? Uh, by as I lay dying. You know, which is the story. Uh, it's a story narrated by 15 characters, and it, it talks about the death, the death of Addie, uh, Addie Bundren. You know, this really monstrous woman, and it's a story of her, her funeral wake, right? And so I, I thought, wow, wow, what a what a compelling idea to tell the story of a funeral wake in, in in these voices. So I initially had 14 voices, including Halima and Jacob Wainwright. I had Livingston himself as a voice. I had. Agnes, Nanny, his daughter, in Eng- waiting in England, um, and I had all sorts of voices. But at one point, I just couldn't distinguish one from the other, so I abandoned it. I abandoned that that idea, and I started to whittle down the voices until I had the two really uh, strong ones that that were most convincing to me, and they were Halima and Jacob. I could see where fourteen voices could get a little confusing. Mm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so how long did you work on this project? I would say about, uh, I mean, it says 21 years is the more dramatic way of putting it, but <laughs> <laughs> probably 18 to 19 years uh, uh, just doing the research, thinking about it. You know, I read uh, one of my favorite um, authors, uh, American author, is uh, Edward P. Jones, who wrote um, one of the most amazing novels about about slavery called uh, the, um, the Known World. And he says that it's a book that had been in his mind for many, many years. But when he actually came to write it down, it took him really only nine months because he had written it in his head so many times that when it came to sort of like putting it all down, it was fairly easy. I won't say I went through a similar process, but I've really been thinking about this novel for a very, very long time. And I knew exactly the arc that I wanted to follow. Once I had solved the problem of the voices, it became very easy to just set it down. And the focus on, I mean, really the book starts with Livingston's death. Was that always the case, or was there earlier on where you were starting earlier in the story? Livingston was always going to be dead when the book started, but in, in, initially I had his voice through his journals. I had a lot more excerpts from his um, from his journals, okay. partly because I wanted I wanted people to know how clever I had been to have extracted so much material from the, from these journals, you know. So, I, but, but I ended up resisting that temptation because it mattered to me that uh, that Livingston be dead before we really uh, sort of like. Set, set off on the journey, and in that I was really inspired by one of my favorite Shakespearean plays, which is Julius Caesar, because of course Caesar is already dead by the time we're sort of a third into the into the play, and he doesn't really matter as himself as an alive Caesar. 
it's his character and the relationships that he has with Cassius and Brutus and Mark Antony. It's, 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 it's that idea of the absent protagonist who drives the plot that, that really is, is what makes uh, Julius Caesar the great play that it is. So I wanted Livingston to have a similar sort of effect uh, that even in his death, he still has this incredible pull on, his, on, his, on the characters. You know, maybe it's a pull of hatred, a pull of love, a pull of loyalty, but it's, it's the fact of Livingston having lived that matters, not so much who he is in himself. You really have brought a lot of influence to, to play in this book. It's, it was you know, about you know, 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time to be thinking about the same thing. Yes, but you were writing other books and stories in the, in the meantime as well, correct? Yes, that's right, yeah. 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 And um, now, do you still practice law also? Well, I actually partly gave up my job to be able to write this novel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was one of the scariest things I've ever done. I was working in Geneva. I had a fantastic job with great colleagues. And you know, if you're working for the International Civil Service in Geneva, you have a tax-free salary. It's an easy life, <laughs> you know. Um, but I needed to sort of like shake myself out of my complacency. So I, I quit my job in in 2015, and I moved to Berlin for a year, which is where I finished, you know, really sort of like putting it all together. Um, and then I got homesick of the law, <laughs> and I ended up going back to my to my country, to Zimbabwe, to help with the transition after the new government t- took over. So I ended up going to help shape a new investment investment policy, but that job ended in July. So at the moment, I'm just a full-time writer, and I have never been more terrified. I bet. I bet, and you're you're in what you're in the United States this week. Yes, at the moment I'm on my book tour, which is really incredible. I'm talking to you from Seattle, um, which is just an, an incredible city, and and the idea that this book has has received such uh, a reception uh, around the world is just really overwhelming. So, in addition to to the U.S., um, I'm going to Finland next week, uh, where it's also been published, and. I'm going to do a, a book tour in Germany and Switzerland as well, and there are about seven other territories um, that are going to be publishing it over the next uh, 12 months or so. It's just been really incredible to see the kind of reception that, you know, I thought this was just something that obsessed me and, and would only interest me. So it's just been marvelous <laughs> to talk to everybody about it. So where, what country was it first published in? Well, it was first published in the U.S. In the U.S.? Uh, and yeah, in the U.S. Out. Yeah, it came out on the eighth of September, I think it was. Wow, and you're and you're yeah. already being published in how many countries? It, it's, it's 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 such a it's such a wonderful problem to have because it's coming out. It came out in three in three countries in the same month. So in the U.S. and then in Finland and then in um, and in Germany. So it's come it's all come out in September. And then next year, sometime, it's coming out in the UK and in France and in Spain. And, in, and, and for me, the most wonderful news was that um, a publisher wants to publish it in Arabic, oh, wow. which to me is such an affirmation that I got the Islam right and I got the, the Arabic that I used right as well. You know? So, I mean, if, if Arabic readers can actually recognize something, in this, something truthful in this, that's just the most wonderful thing. So how much influence did the did Arabics have in this in Central Africa in the 1800s? Oh, huge influ- influence. I mean, the, the, the Arabs got to East Africa long before the the Europeans uh, arrived. Um, in fact, I would say that the Arabs were probably there even before the Portuguese. Uh, so that they are long established ties between the Arab world and, and the African world. And, and in fact, the East African slave trade, which provides a background to, to, to the novel, was a long established slave trade, even before the, the slave trade on, on the West African uh, coast uh, began. But what's really interesting is that it hasn't featured that much in fiction, that is the East African slave trade. We know so much more about the the Middle Passage. We know so much more about the West African slave trade because of the wonderful works of, uh, you know, Toni Morrison and, and, and other fantastic authors. But the East African slave trade hasn't had the same impact uh, in literature uh, as one would expect it to have. 
it's interesting that Livingston is is a is a name that's not only known in Africa, but it's it's known and you mentioned too, it's known in in the United States. It's something that, uh, and I don't remember actually studying it in school, but I must have the whole thing because it it you know it's something that and that that quote. Uh, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Livingston, I presume. I think what it is is that there was a famous film, Stanley, Stanley, there was a famous Stanley Livingston film sometime, it was a Hollywood film, I think sometime in the 50s or so. And I think the, 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 that Livingston story, especially the, the encounter between Livingston and Stanley, is such a fantastic entry point for Americans into the history of pre colonial Africa because uh, apart from the slave trade, um, there was there was no other history after the slave trade between the Americans and and, and the Africans. So and this idea of this dashing uh, figure of Stanley, you know, without being asked by anybody really, just taking off and on this mission as a journalist, you know, the New York Herald to try and rescue this this American. I think it's something that really, especially for 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 your generation, Caroline. I think it's something that people would have known. Uh, and especially because of that film, whereas I think for for the younger generation, Monica and you know um, p- p- people our age and younger, I'm assuming Monica we're more we are sort of like similar ages here. Probably, <laughs> I, may, I may be a little bit older than you. <laughs> right, but I mean it's only history that you would have studied in school as an American. I think I think it's something that you would know sort of like uh, as a pop cultural reference because exactly. of this famous film. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. 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 But, but it's interesting, though, that because it's interesting that it has become such a pop culture reference in in America and still is, as far as I know. Although I should ask my kids and my grandkids if they no, – grandkids probably not because they're just little. But, <laughs> but my kids, if they're familiar with the story. And yet there's so much about the story that I don't know. And one yeah, of the I- things that I did not know really was about um, – how prevalent the Arab influence was, and also that the British, after they banned slavery, which of course they banned slavery early, earlier than the United States did, but that they took it upon themselves to to stop the slave trade by um, going after trader ships. Um, t- can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Um so the British abolished slavery in about 1833, that they abolished the slave trade. And what they then did was that to stop um, the slaves from, from, from leaving the coast, they, they ran blockades, they, they ran gunboats to actually rescue slaves that, 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 that they captured on the high seas. So what happened to Jacob Wainwright, who's, who's a real-life person and who I use as a character in my in my book is that he was rescued on the high seas by a British gunboat. And then, of course, the question is, once these slaves had been rescued, where would they be taken? They couldn't exactly go home because for many of them, they didn't even know where home was. And there would be parties of slaves coming from different parts of Africa. So what they did, what the British did was to start a school called the Massic School in India in the Principality of Bombay. By then already, the British co- co- controlled um, um, in many parts of India. So they started this school for the freed slaves, and it was to this school that Jacob Wainwright and other young boys would be taken, and they were given new names, they were Christianized, they were taught how to read and write, taught to speak English, uh, given European clothing, and also they learned a trade. So they would either learn agriculture or carpentry or welding or map reading um, or map drawing. And then when the explorers came to you know, to look for young people to, to accompany them back to Africa. These these former slaves were were highly suitable because in addition to all of these skills, they also spoke the original languages. Now, in in your book, the perspective or the, the section from Jacob Wainwright's point of view is written as um, entries in his journal. Did he actually keep a journal? 
He did indeed, and um, can you believe that they actually found the journal uh, about two months ago, but we had already gone to print, oh so I couldn't gosh. read it. Oh my yeah, gosh. But, but I was so excited, I was so excited, and so one of the things I'm hoping to do uh, in November is to go to Scotland and actually read the, the, the bits of the journal that they managed to find, which is, um, which is just to me the most wonderful thing, because... Any opportunity to tell the story of these companions is one that I welcome, especially if uh, there's uh, historical facts that we can rely on. I think it's just wonderful. One thing that struck me was that both of your narrators um, have a little bit of the unreliable narrator aspect uh, to their characters. Um, Halima, you know, describes herself as being, um, you know, not ever being a gossip and, and you know, that she could make Ooh, I'm her... not one to gossip. I'm <laughs> yeah. never one to gossip. <laughs> yes. And, and she says, oh, she could make her, her um, husband, her man's um, life miserable if she weren't so sweet and, and sweet, you know, had such a sweet <laughs> tongue, <laughs> which, you know, as you say, was not how she was perceived by, uh, by Dr. Livingston. And, yeah. and Jacob Wainwright talks about... Um, how he doesn't like to be the center of attention and doesn't <laughs> when it's quite obvious that he really likes being the center of attention and and uh, considers himself the the true leader of this um, of this journey. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I'm fascinated that you that that you call them unreliable narrators. I, I um, that's that's really interesting because. Of course, they're unreliable about themselves, so they have very little insight into their own, into their own characters and how they appear to others. But I think that's a lot of us. I think a lot of us are completely self-deluded <laughs> about how we right. are, <laughs> about how we appear to others. But in terms of the, of actually the action itself, in terms of their reliability to tell us what is going on, Halima and Jacob are absolutely unreliable, but in two very different ways. So Halima, who narrates the first part of the novel, is unreliable because she is an uneducated, uh, illiterate woman, very intelligent, but uneducated, uh, who doesn't really understand what the source of the Nile is, what Livingston's mission is. She doesn't really understand who these Nasik boys are who've come from the school in India. So she's unreliable in the sense that her, her knowledge is limited. But in terms of her insights into human beings, uh, she is absolutely spot on. She knows who to trust and who not to trust, right? Whereas Jacob is unreliable in a different way. He is extremely reliable on the geography. This is where we are in relation to where we are going. Uh, he understands Stevenson's mission, although he judges him for not having been enough of a proselytizer. But he's extremely unreliable in that he doesn't really understand people. And so he, he ends up being uh, the dupe of one of the main characters. Um, so I wanted to contrast that unreliability. So the reason, for instance, Halima stops narrating as soon as the journey starts is because she couldn't have told us anything useful in terms of where they were because that knowledge is not within her, right? Whereas Jacob Wainwright, who could tell us something very useful about where they are in terms of the journey, can't really tell us much about the characters because he's, he's, he has a sort of a blind spot when it comes to people. You're mm -hmm. listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Patina Gappa, author of Out of Darkness, Shining Light. And it is the story of the journey of Dr. Livingston's body after his death when he was, his companions took him to the coast took his body to the coast. What were the reasons behind that? Why, why did they make that, that decision? That, that is a, such a good question, and it's a question that I spent many years trying to answer. And I actually came up with maybe five reasons. Uh, but because the reasons are in conflict with each other, <laughs> I decided to sort of like parcel them out uh, and share them out. <laughs> so different people have different reasons for acting the way they did. I mean, first of all, there was um, the pecuniary um, reason. You know, some of them thought, oh, we're going to get rewarded if we do this. You know, uh, people are going to be very happy to see Livingston's body, especially to see his maps and journals and things. So let's do it for the money. So that was one reason. Another reason was fear. 
fear that they would be suspected of his murder if they didn't return with him. Because these, were going to go, these men were going to go back to Zanzibar anyway. That's where they, for, they were from. So they could hardly turn up, you know, uh, with no Livingston and no, you know, way to account for where he is. So they thought, you know what, let's carry his body, prove our innocence. And um, so, so, so that's one of the reasons they did that. Another reason, I think, was a different kind of fear, fear of being haunted, fear of being, you know, plagued forever by, by Livingston if they left him on, uh, on a strange land. So there was also that. And then another reason slightly linked to the, uh, to the second fear was hatred, like the hatred of this white man. You know, why should he be buried on our soil? Let's take him, you know, and bury him where he belongs, right? Mm. And then the final reason, I think, for some of the companions, especially those who had been with him longest, and especially for the youngest of them, there was real love and a sense of loyalty. Mm. There were a lot of different, lot of different uh, feelings there, and that's uh, yeah. And because you know, the, a lot of these uh, feelings co- co- conflict with each other. I couldn't ascribe all the motives to all of them, uh, so I sort of like parcelled them out to, to, the, to the different companions. Well, that makes sense. Now, how did you go about researching this? And in terms of the incidents that happened on this journey. You know, I know that, that Dr. Livingston's explorations were documented by in his own journals, but from then on, how did you, are, are, are those things that you were able to prove factually, some of the events, or was it, is it all part of the fiction? Well, that's, that's a, another very good question. So this, my, my first source, I'm, and, and uh, I'm not a historian, uh, in any real way, but I always believe that the first source should be primary sources. So my first uh, sources were the primary sources, the journals themselves, Livingston's journals themselves, and th- that's where I, I got to learn about Halima, about Jacob Wainwright, about expedition life, you know, how how each day was conducted, you know, what, what time they would start marching, when they would stop for lunch, you know, so the mechanics of expedition life, I got all of that from David Livingston's journeys, journals, sorry. Um, and then as for the what then happened after his death, Chuma and Susie, who are two of the companions uh, and two of the best-known companions, were then invited to England as uh, uh, some of Livingston's friends were preparing his last journal for publication. They were invited to England to fill in the gaps that um, they couldn't work out themselves because normally Livingston edited his own journals, right? But this time he was not there. So these two companions were brought out of Africa to help with the, with the process of completing the journal. And then they were also asked for their own separate narration of their own journey with the body. And that was published as an appendix to Livingston's journal. But again, it's very mechanical. There isn't a lot of, you know, um, information about the, the, how relations stood with each other. It's really just we came here and then we came here and then, and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened. So what I tried to do as far as possible was to be faithful to the factual detail of how the journey actually went down. So, for instance, there's a famous battle uh, that I describe in some detail in, near a town called Chawendi, and this actually happened uh, because the, the, the companions talk, talk a lot about how they had to overrun a town, and of course they're very, they're very circumspect about how it all happened. But, you know, reading between the lines, you can sort of like tell that they were incredibly hungry, so they forced themselves into this town, and then they ended up in this big battle. So I really relied on those primary sources, and then I filled in the gaps um, myself. Was it hard to get access to all that information? Oh, not at all. I mean, I, I, everywhere I traveled, especially as I was promoting my, my first three books, everywhere I traveled, um, I would go to an antiquarian bookstore and try to find as much material as I could um, on, Dave, on Livingston. And I actually have such a large collection, <laughs> I now call it my Livingstonia collection. Ah! <laughs> with all his uh, his original journals, I have newspapers from his state funeral. I have so much material, and uh, so I became sort of like a little bit of an expert on the life of David Livingston, which is a shame because now I have all this material, and I don't know what to do with it now that the novel is done. <laughs> well, you could write another one of some earlier events in his, hmm. in his See, I, I would love to write about Stanley but I don't like him as much as I like Livingston mm. 
Yeah. Oh, and I've just come across that film that I was telling you about. It's a Spencer Tracy film called Stanley and Livingston, ah. in which Spencer Tracy plays Stanley and uh, Cedric Hardwick plays um, plays Livingston. Oh, wow. And it ah. came out in 1939 and was greatly successful. 1939. Yeah. Wow. So, mm. Bettina, would you like to read a little bit from Out of Darkness, Shining Light? Absolutely. Do you have anything in particular you want me to read? or? It's all good, so you choose. <laughs> all right. So, so let me read from the prologue. Perfect. It's the easiest. This is how we carried out of Africa the poor broken body of Wana Daudi, the doctor, David Livingston, so that he could be born across the sea and buried in his own land. For more than 1,500 miles, from the interior to the eastern coast, we marched with his body, from Chitambo to Wanamuzungu, from Chisalamala to Kumbakumba, from Lambalamfipa to Tabora, until 285 days after we left Chitambo, we reached Bagamoyo, that place of sorrow, whose very name means to lay to rest the burden of your heart. We set him down in the hushed peace of the church, and all through that long night prayed and sang and keened the 700 manumitted slaves from the village of the free. After the tide came in the following day, they lined up on either side of the path that led to the dow of his final crossing. And we watched until the white sail of that rickety wooden boat was a small dark triangle on the far horizon, and all that we could see of him was the sky meeting the shimmering sea. He gave up his life to the doomed, demented search for the last great secret of that heaven-descended spring, the world's longest river. He gave his all to uncover the secret that had preoccupied men of learning for more than 2,000 years, the source of the Nile. In the final two years of his life, both before and after he was relieved in Ujiji by the American Juana Stanley, he was as a man possessed. In every town and village through which we passed, he asked always the same question. Had any person seen or heard of a place where four fountains rose, four great fountains that rose out of the ground between two hills with conical tops? They were the fountains described in ancient times by a long dead sage called Herodotus, he said, from the far off land of Greece. To find these fountains, Wana Daudi believed, was to find the source of the Nile. When they asked to know what this Nile was, he said it was the world's longest river, but more than a river, it was a miracle of creation splendid beyond comprehension. For it flows for every day of the year for more than 1,000 miles through the most arid of deserts, all without being replenished, for there are no tributaries that flow to fill it, he said. Wana Daudi was certain that these fountains linked to four great rivers that he knew already, those of Kafue, Lomame, Luapula, and Zambezi. Herodotus, he said, had written that water from these fountains flowed in two directions, with half going up to Egypt and the other half flowing southward. And thus it was that we followed the southward flow of the Luapula into the swamps of Bangweulu, but there, instead of finding the headwaters of the Nile, in the village of Chitambo, Guana Daudi found his death. He is as divided in death as he was in life. His bones lie now in his own land, entombed in the magnificence of ancient stone. In the grave we dug for him under the shade of a mvula tree, his heart and all the essential parts of him are at one with the soil of his travels. The grave of his bones proclaims that he was brought over land and sea by our faithful hands. The wise men of his age say he blazed into the darkness of our natal land to leave behind him a track of light where the white men who followed could go in perfect safety. This is all we 69 have ever been in his world, the 69 who carried his bones, the dark companions, his dark companions, the shadowy figures in the caravans in which he moved. We were only ever the Pagazi on his journeys, the porters and bearers who carried his loads and built his huts and cooked his meals and washed his clothes and made his beds, the Askari who fought his battles, his loyal and faithful retinue. <laughs> 
On the long and perilous journey to bring him home, ten of our party lost their lives. There are no stones to mark the places where they rest, no epitaphs to announce their deaths. And when we who remain follow where they led, no pilgrims will come to show the children where we lie. But out of that great and troubling darkness came shining light. Thank you. And that is Thank Patina, you very much. Yeah. That is Patina Gappa reading from Out of Darkness, Shining Light. And I was going to ask you where the title came from, but there's the answer right there. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the, the title is a very interesting one, especially for those <clears throat> who are interested in writing, because the, the book was actually called The Last Journey of Dr. Livingston. And then in brackets, from the interior to the coast of Africa, as narrated by his companions in three volumes. But, you know, um, the early readers were a bit perplexed because the journey itself only starts halfway through the novel. So they said, well, you can't exactly call it the last journey when the journey starts so late because we're just flicking the pages waiting for the journey to start. And then I realized I'd made a mistake. I'd made the journey the focus, whereas the focus really is the relationships that David Livingston has with his companions and they with each other. So I changed the title <laughs> to take care of uh, of that particular concern. Well, I think that that was that, that was a good idea. That was well done. Yeah. So you were writing this when you actually sat down and to finish the book. You said you were in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And and I'm just wondering is that would it, have, it was it harder to write when you're so far from the part of the world that you're writing about? Um, in many ways, it was easier because I had actually gathered all the material that I needed. I mean, I had all this research. And my worry, though, was that I would become so obsessed with the research, I would actually forget what the research was for. <laughs> you know, so I just thought to myself, this is it. You know, I, I, I listened to a wonderful um, interview with Hilary Mantel, who's one of my favorite historical fiction writers, and, and she's written wonderfully about Thomas Cromwell, you know, in, in her Tudor novels. And she said that she was very disappointed that she was seemed to be the only person who was interested in the color of curtains in the Tudor period. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's exactly how, how I felt, you know, I... I really began to know the mechanics of expedition life extremely well. And I just thought, well, I could actually go, just go on researching and researching and researching, but at some point I'm going to have to write. I'm going to have to start, to start writing this thing. And uh, so that's, that's eventually what, what propelled me to just finish, uh, you know, start the novel again and finish it. And up to now, I still have a lot of research that I want to do, but it probably won't be for the novel, it will be just for myself. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. you visit many of the places that you write about? Were you actually, did you go to these villages? Um, I visited Bagamoyo, which is the place, the last place it was on African soil. I spent a month and a half writing in Zanzibar because I really needed to get a flavor of, uh, of the place. And I also taught myself Swahili, um, which is a, an East African language that is uh, a little bit similar to the language that I speak, Shona, but, you know, they're very different languages. So I, I taught myself, you know, sort of basic Swahili words. And actually my party trick is to read in Swahili, uh, in the, the Swahili Bible to my Kenyan friends, and they, they start freaking out, and of course they, they laugh at my accent. Uh, so I did, I did a lot of that, that research. Um, I haven't yet been, I've been to Westminster Abbey, where, where his um, bones are buried, but I haven't actually yet been to Chitambo, where his heart is buried. Mm. Um, because I always thought of it as sort of like, this is my final pilgrimage. So at some point this year, I'm going to go to Chitambo and visit the grave of his heart. So did anyone ever find the source of the Nile? Yes. <laughs> yes, uh, and it wasn't where Livingston thought it was. And in fact, um, uh, w one of the fascinating things about Livingston is, is that he was such a spectacular failure at everything, <laughs> including... <laughs> Including, uh, including, you know, as, as an explorer. But the, the, the source of the Nile is somewhere up near... Um, Uganda, Sudan, thereabouts. It's definitely not in Zambia, where Livingston thought you would find it. Uh -huh. And also, you know, he relied on Herodotus. 
Now, to be fair to Livingston, in, in his time, you know, Herodotus was called the father of history. But now he's more, uh, better known as the father of lies. Ah. <laughs> because almost all of his history was untrue. It was mainly legend rather than history. Well, what yeah. I wondered about is if you're looking for the source of a river, why don't you go upstream, just follow the river upstream? Was it impossible to get through the the topography if you you know if you started where you know at the Nile River and you just I know you can't you couldn't necessarily you know they didn't have power boats you couldn't necessarily take a boat up river but couldn't you walk alongside the river? Yeah, you know, that's actually a very interesting question because all of the other travelers who are looking, all the other explorers who are looking, was like looking in roughly the same place, right? It's only Livingston who had this weird idea <laughs> that, oh, Herodotus says it's somewhere in the south. It's, it's somehow, he really had this weird uh, obsession with the connection between the Nile and the Zambezi. And, of course, the Zambezi is a large river that is found in southern Africa. So he was following that, that source instead of actually, as you say, you know, you kind of like follow... The, the flow of the water, and you know, you maybe ask people, you know, do you know where this river begins? They might actually have a better idea yeah. than Herodotus. <laughs> <laughs> it, does, it does seem kind of, uh, kind of like a silly way to go about finding the source of a river. But he wasn't; ex he was expecting it to be much more than just the source of the river. He was, yes, like, he was yes. expecting, what, the Fountain of Youth or something? Or, what, what did he think was, I know it was four fountains, but did they, were they supposed to have magical properties? So, sorry, I didn't get that question. So what did he expect these four fountains that, that Herodotus wrote about? What did, did he expect them to have magical properties? Oh, no, it wasn't magical properties. He actually thought that the, the Nile gushed out of the, of the land in four fountains. And it, it became four rivers. You know, one fountain was the Zambezi, one fountain was something else, one fountain was something else, and the other fountain was the Nile. So he thought there was a connection mm. between this report that uh, Herodotus says to, he heard from somebody who heard it from somebody who heard <laughs> it from somebody who once traveled in Ethiopia. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it was like, you know, a fourth hand rumor, that kind of thing, yeah. Wow. No, I mean, Livingston was a spectacularly poor geographer and explorer. And one of the funny <laughs> things that he did was um, he tried to, to build a, a boat that was supposed to sail upstream on the Zambezi. And so I was thinking, you can't exactly sail against the current, David Livingston. You want to sail with the current, you know. So, again, that wasn't a very successful expedition. <laughs> but I think he, he, he actually, he, he was a doctor. That was his uh, training. And he was a, a missionary. And, again, then he was very poor as, as a missionary. He was a, a, a spectacular failure because he only converted one person <laughs> who then changed his mind. <laughs> So really, I, I think David Livingston's success was really in the relationships that he had with his companions. Wow. wow. Yeah. And so he's credited with helping to end the slave trade, but did he really do that much? Oh, yes. I mean, I, I want to be fair to him. Yes, I would say that uh, he was successful in death mm -hmm. and not in life because his, his eyewitness account of that terrible Manuema massacre when this market... Um, in, this, in Manuema country was overrun by, by slave traders, it, it so outraged people after it was published, um, uh, po, you know, posthumously, that it put pressure on, on the British government to really push the Sultan of Zanzibar to end the, the Zanzibar slave market, which had remained open even though the British had actually uh, abolished the, the slave trade. So yes, in that respect, he was successful um, in, in helping to end the slave trade. Now, one of the characters in your book had claimed that he was really a sultan who had fallen on hard times. Was that, was he a real person, a real character? Well, he, he's not a real character, but, uh, you know, Zimbabwe is full of people who claim that they were emperors, uh, the descendants of emperors. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, I don't know if you, if you noticed, but he's, 
he's actually the only Zimbabwean in my in that in that novel. Everybody else is from East Africa, you know, uh, from Zanzibar and so on. But he's from uh, an empire in the south with uh, with links to a great stone city. So I just wanted to have this one Zimbabwean character in there who who's you know dreaming of a lost kingdom. The kingdom is actually a real one. It was an empire called the Mutapa Empire, and it really was uh, overrun by the Portuguese. And uh, the Portuguese en- ended the, the, the rule of the Mutapas um, in the, I think it was early, late 1700s, early 1800s. It had been an empire in existence for 400 years, and it was eventually destroyed by the Portuguese. So that that is a historical fact. And in fact, um, that's now where my obsession is turning. I'm now turning to write about the Mutapa Empire. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, you certainly know a lot of African history. Yes, it's one of my very favorite subjects. I'm, I'm very lucky to have done um, African history uh, for my, I don't know what the equivalent of A-levels is in, in, in the U.S., but the last two years of high school, mm. you're allowed to do three subjects. So I chose English literature, Shona, which is my language, and I chose history. And then we really did in-depth African history and also the history of Europe from the 1848 revolutions up to De Gaulle. You know, so those are the two areas of history that I that I know and love really well. And by by putting those history, those historical events into a novel, you're able to spread the information probably a lot wider than you would if you wrote a book of history. Yes, I mean I'm always lecturing my son about. It. My son is also a history buff, right? But he's he's getting really irritated by uh, my. Do you know? Oh, Kush, do you know this? Kush, do you know that? It's like, oh, mommy, just write another book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's what I'm hoping to do. I'm, I'm hoping that this this novel is the first in what I hope will be a series of of historical novels. Well, you're certainly off to a good start. And that's novels published by Scribner, which is um, a division of Simon and Schuster. Did they publish your earlier novels, or is this, um, or your earlier novel and and short stories, or was this your first? No, time? actually, my, my my first two books were published by FSG. Okay. Yeah, I, I had uh, you know, I it was published by FSG as part of a partnership with my publisher in the UK, uh, which is Faber and Faber. So they had a Faber imprint. In, in the U.S. Mm-hmm. that was under the uh, under the uh, FSG house, and they published my my first two books. Um, but that imprint is no more, uh, and I'm very I'm very happy to be to be with Scribner, who's been absolutely wonderful. Mom, do you have any questions before we close? Uh, no, but you know I learned an awful lot just <laughs> listening to her, and uh, I really admire what she did. You Thank know, you so much. It's it's a it's a really gripping story, and um, the first part, you know, that's written from Halima's point of view, it's maybe a little hard for Western readers because there's so many um, names to get familiar with, and you know, a lot of uh, Arabic words, and, mm. and other. I think there's Arabic words, and there's what. The other words are in what language? Swahili? Or? In, in Swahili, yeah, Swahili. in Swahili. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping that the glossary um, sort of they, the helps glossary a little bit. The glossary helps a lot. Um, yeah. I think, I think a, a list of characters might help too. You know, a little just. Okay, we'll think about that for the next for the next yeah. version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah that's uh, a very good idea. But once you get well, I get a list of characters in my own for my own writing. I had a dramatist <laughs> person there because I had to keep track of everybody. Of yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah. But once you and once you get into this story, it's really gripping. It's hard to put it down. It's. Um, oh. Yeah. And. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. And yeah, the writing is wonderful. So, thank you so much for being with us today, Patina. Thank you very much, Monica and Caroline. I look forward to um, to, to discovering more of your podcast. Thank oh, you so much. I'm, I hope I hope that you do. And mom, do you have some closing words for us today? Yes, I do. Um, remember, in our journey of life, that nobody makes it alone because you need to have a grateful heart and be quick to acknowledge those who help you. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Patina. Thank you, Mom. And see you all next week on Writer's Voices. Thank Bye-bye. you so much. Bye.